Thanks, Caleb. <sighs> Tip, mate. If you can make jokes, they usually should uh, be, be humorous uh, and relatable. But uh, thank you, Caleb. No, it's good, to, it's good, Caleb, doing the LBC for us today. It's good to get a little nap in before the sermon, isn't it, everybody? Thank you for the lively exposition of uh, the historical creed. Uh, 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 he's, he's fired. We don't have a, a head deacon anymore. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, can you please open to Hebrews chapter 2? Uh, what a blessing to be back with you. I know I was um, uh, away last week on a uh, trip with some uh, real gems of the congregation up on an uh, uh, evangelistic church strengthening uh, trip that we had in our own backyard. We went to uh, far north Queensland. We had the offer, the honour, uh, I should say, and the fun of um, evangelising with some locals in Ingham and in uh, uh, Gordon Vale and uh, Atherton and other surrounding areas, we're able to meet with and encourage a local church, hold a bit of a, uh, a conference on God's work in and through the church, what the Great Commission is and how that should shape our relationship with the unbelievers all around us and how we should expect and pray for a work of revival in our neighborhoods. It was a, um, it was a blessed time. I think probably the people who, who benefited, I want, to, I want to say most, I'm going to venture on that, the people who benefited most were the people from our own congregation who went up there, who were not used to evangelizing, who, were, who had not really been active in that kind of discipline beforehand and who just uh, had their, their fellowship and their, um, uh, uh, their souls really stirred in the fire of mission. There's no greater place to uh, build deep bonds together with other Christians than in the fire of mission together. So I invite you along the next time we do one, uh, uh, I would encourage you to throw your hat in if you've never been evangelizing, and we should, we should, we should, but if you haven't ever, that shouldn't stop you from joining one of the teams. You can just go, the team will help you out and uh, run some defense. We had to look out for Nathaniel a couple of times, nearly died, some locals got angry. He's not a robust guy, so we, we, we sent out uh, uh, the gals to defend him. Nonetheless, <laughs> as dangerous as it gets, it was all very joyful, and uh, uh, I thank God especially that um, uh, Chris was able to bring the word. Was it okay last week? All right, Chris, I didn't think it was that bad. Uh, don't listen to them. No, it was, it was great to have the Lord uh, bless us through his, his ministry. And we pray, of course, for all the future bright ministry that Chris has ahead of him, no doubt. So in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, we continue this amazing, this mind-bending. And it's, it's explosive to our brains or we're not reading it right. I have no inclination today. I have no intention of getting through this passage and making sense of it. I can't do it. I can show you how the reasoning ties together. I can show you how the Old Testament passages uh, shed light uh, on the New Testament and how the New Testament passages shed light on the Old. I think I can, I can show to you the flow of the logic and why the writer writes it this way. I have no intention of making it make rational sense because we are diving and delving into the very depths of the mystery of God in salvation in what we call the incarnation of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer was arguing, uh, using the Old Testament to show that Jesus is, without qualification, God the Son. He is entirely God. He has every attribute that God has in himself. He shares the absolute substance and essence and nature as the Father, even though he, he is distinct as the eternal Son. In chapter 2, uh, we've been seeing that Jesus is also truly, absolutely, not from all eternity, but from the moment of his conception in his mother's womb, Jesus is absolutely, truly human. And last, we're taking this in two parts. Last week, we saw that Jesus is one of us in that he shares our status. The very status of human beings as being over the earth, but under the angels, as being subject to this world and then eventually crowned with honor. Jesus also, as it were, wore our badge, put on our uniform, and he acted in and through our status. He, he fully took on our status. Uh, we could uh, use the language of, um, ancient writers love this language, but it is still uh, fairly commonplace today, of recapitulation. That's a big word, don't worry about it. We use the word all the time. We just shorten it to recap. You might recap a movie or recap a book. And what it means is to walk through the most important part so that you understand the whole. And Jesus did that for humanity. He came and recapitulated what it means to be a human. He walked through the most important and foundational and essential and substantial steps in the human story from God's creation to his uh, uh, being under the angels, to fighting the devil, to uh, being under sin on the cross, to resurrection, to cr being crowned with glory. And so he has lived as a true human under the human status, showing us what our ultimate destiny is. Here was our main idea from last week. 
that Jesus has become everything, uh, he has become like us in everything without sin, so that we one day will become like him in everything except for his divinity. He has become like us in everything without sin, so that we might become like him in everything except divinity. And this is our idea today, that Jesus has not just represented us in name or status or badge, but that Jesus has actually taken on, in every respect, our flesh and blood nature. When we say that Jesus is truly human, we mean that he did condescend to our status, and this week we're seeing that he has fully condescended to our nature of flesh and blood. Would you look at Hebrews chapter 2? We're going to be reading from verse 10 to verse 18. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, that's God, in bringing many sons to glory, that's a great summary of salvation, God bringing sons to glory and many of them, in doing so, he should make the founder of our salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, and he's going to quote Old Testament passages, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, though that through death he might destroy the one who has power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. May God bless this word in our midst and to his glory this morning. The language of this section of this text is utterly astounding. It suggests to us, under this idea that, uh, of, of chapter 2 of God becoming man in Jesus, it suggests to us this mind-bending reality. It almost sounds blasphemous. Don't throw your heavy study Bibles at me. It brings to us this idea and this truth that our salvation is so glorious, mysterious, multifaceted, and amazing that it required something that even God did not have by nature. Hold the stones. Hold the stones. I'll, I'll defend this from Scripture. So deep was our need of a Savior, so intricate our precise need of salvation, so particular the things we had to be saved from, that the salvation that God himself had designed did not have by nature in himself the properties required to affect it. It sounds blasphemous until I introduce this, this reality. The, the very thing that he needed, which he didn't have by nature, is flesh and blood. He did not have those things by nature. That is not a part of his eternal attributes and uh, uh, substance or essence. That's not God. God designed a way of salvation that could not be effected unless he himself took on to himself something other than what he was by nature from all of eternity. God has so ordained in salvation, there be something that he was not from all eternity. Not a savior, he was that from all eternity. Always predestining to save. He was perfect, he was glorious, he was righteous, he was merciful, he's all these things. But the thing he was not from all eternity until that fateful day in Bethlehem was he was not a man. He did not have flesh and blood as salvation history and as the scriptures show to us this is a problem because for those of flesh and blood as as this passage tells us for people of flesh and blood to be forgiven of sins committed in the flesh and in the blood for us to have our payment made which is a payment of flesh and blood and life for that to be affected somebody our savior has to be flesh and blood but anybody that is flesh and blood by nature from the very beginning of their existence is going to be sinners like us and unable to save a multitude. Therefore, the Savior has to be God, but the Savior has to be truly 
and fully man in a like nature to ours. Or, as Hebrews 2 says, he must be like us in every respect, including a flesh and blood nature. The fact that there is something required in salvation that God does not have by nature does not speak to his limitedness. It does not mean that he is deficient, that there is a limit in his beings. It is, in fact, the perfections of his beings, the eternality of his being, that means he can't be what we need. We need a mortal savior. We need someone that can die. In that sense, God is no help to us by nature. This is not stretch our, our capacity to really, to really get our mind around the, 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 the bends of the gospel. We, we kind of have to lean a little bit far back that you feel you're about to fall into heresy. And what I'm telling you is, there is in Jesus, in the Savior, a necessity that was met that was not able to be met in God himself by nature. But this doesn't mean that salvation came from outside of God. It was man's solution and man's ideation or conceiving of the idea and we submitted it to God. All of this glorious salvation, this mystery that God had to condescend in order to save the people he predestined to save, he had to do it. This, this, this requirement was put on himself by himself. This was put on himself by his own eternal promises. This is a necessity that came about because God wanted to save people who could only be saved by a flesh and blood saviour. This whole amazing conception comes to us in this passage. Look at this phrase as the first phrase we're going to consider in chapter 10. In chapter 2, verse 10, we are told, if, if that isn't enough uh, mind-bending reality already for us, the gospel is something more than just God being God. The gospel is God taking on flesh to accomplish that which God planned. There's something else, and that is this, that Jesus had to be made perfect. And you pause, and you think you, you must have a bad translation. This is one of those, those liberal trends. This can't be in the actual God-breathed scripture that God had to make Jesus perfect through a life of discipline and training. Could it possibly mean that? When we speak about Jesus being made perfect, we are speaking in a similar sense than when we says, God the Son is not able to be our Savior until he is incarnate. We have to say that. That's the reality of this passage. He had to be made flesh, it says. It was fitting for him to be made perfect through suffering, this passage says. It was required. It was an absolute necessity that for salvation, God the Son take on a nature that was not his by nature. So, so on one hand, we've said God the Son needs to, needs to do something in order to be our Savior. He can't just be in his own eternal attributes. He needs to be more than that. What a thought. Well, also, Jesus, born, perfect man, without sin, he wasn't perfect. No, no, he was perfect. He was, he was perfect if by perfection we mean sinless. Then yes, he was born perfect. He was perfect in his mother's womb. Free from the stain of original sin, as the angel told Mary, uh, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you so that the child will be a son of the Most High. He'll be the Holy One. We understand that. He was sinless in his perfection, but he was not perfect in his perfection. Now that doesn't make sense. That's just us admitting we're so far from perfect, we don't even realize there's levels up there. We're so far down on ground floor, we don't realize there's a penthouse and a penthouse roof and then an infinity pool beyond that. We're in the slums, so yet we don't understand multiple high levels of perfection. Here's what we mean. When we say Jesus was made perfect, when the writer of the Bible says that God made Jesus perfect through suffering, we don't mean that he took him from imperfection and turned him into something perfect so that he could be a high priest for our salvation. We mean that God took the perfect Jesus and moved him from perfection to greater and greater perfection so that he could be our high priest. Now, even still saying that, how in the world can something be perfect but not fully perfect? How can Jesus be a perfect child but not able to die for us? And I'm submitting exactly that to you. Jesus was not able to die for us as a young boy. Being sinless in his, in his perfection is not enough. Let me uh, submit it to you this way. We might travel to some uh, uh, Alps in the fine island and nation of Japan and find an ancient artisan who is clay making some wonderful vase that is going to sit in the emperor's palace. And there we find him and he's got the, the finest, most pure 
perfect lump of clay. This is not the stuff your kids make breakable jars out of for Mother's Day trash. I mean, gifts. This is the finest of artisan and uh, antique craftsmanship. This, this clay is perfect. There's no impurities. There's no grains, there's no clumps, it is wonderfully smooth, it is like butter, it is perfect in its color and its texture. It's without flaw. And yet that clump of clay sitting there in front of the, the artisan is still, is still insufficient and unable to be that which it is designed for, which is a vase in the emperor's palace. It has to go through a process of being perfect in its, in its uh, purity to become perfect for its purpose, do you understand? So Jesus, in his, in his boyhood, in his uh, in conception, in his mother's womb, in his birth, in his living, until he had completed the life that God had ordained for him to live, undergoing testing and undergoing a proving of his perfections, Jesus was perfect in sinlessness, but not perfect for his purpose. He had to be made like us in every respect. And therefore, he had to be undergoing a full life of experience. Jesus had to be prepared for the office of mediator. He had to be in every step. We we should not mean that at some point Jesus became God or became the Savior. He always was. But he was not ready to make the sacrifice until he completed and fulfilled all righteousness. Of course, that's a phrase that we get from Matthew's gospel. I can try and help you think of this in biblical terms so it doesn't just sound like me philosophizing. The reality is this, that when Jesus was baptized in the baptism of repentance from sins, now, last time I heard and thought about this, to repent of sins, you need sins. That seems like a pretty important part of that. And and that's how John the Baptist was thinking, so I'm in good company. Jesus, the perfect cousin that he had, the, the Messiah, the Savior that John was declaring, Jesus comes down into the waters and requests that John baptize him. And of course, John said, you shouldn't be baptized for repentance. You got nothing to repent of. Can you baptize me? But, but of course, Jesus wasn't in that moment acting in the, in the uh, uh, role, uh, touching his divine side. He was touching the human side. And to be a human obedient to all that God had commanded, he needed to obey all that God commanded. And God had recently commanded through John the Baptist that you must be baptized. So here he was with no sin, but in order to keep it that way, he had to be baptized. And Jesus basically just uh, explains that in much fewer words to John the Baptist. He says, John, get over it. Right? He says, John, permit it to be so now. Right? Stop telling me I'm wrong. That, that's a bad idea. Like you said, I'm the Messiah. He says, John, permit it to be so now, for it is necessary for me to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is saying, I must step out in obedience. I must walk the plank of every single command made by God in order to fill up all righteousness. Now, of course, John might have thought what I would naturally think, and maybe you think it too, that if Jesus told you in his earthly ministry, I need to fulfill all righteousness, I would say, you're sinless. You have fulfilled all righteousness. You fulfilled all righteousness since the day you were born. You are sinless. But it, that, that is just the idea. Perfection in this idea does not mean sinless. It means fully made, ready, completely satisfying to all of God's commandments in his law so that he can make the sacrifice. Yes, Jesus was perfect, but he needed to go from sinless perfection to law-fulfilling perfection throughout his whole life. And this is the mind-bending idea that I've done my best to explain. I told you, I'm not going to make anything make sense. I'm just going to try and explain what it says. He says that Jesus was made perfect. Made perfect. The founder of our salvation was made perfect. What an amazing thought. From perfection to greater perfection. But it goes even more specifically, and this is at the end of verse 10. He says that he must be made perfect through suffering. Now, follow the logic of the writer of the book of Hebrews. His his whole argument is he has to be made like us in every respect. So on his process from going a, a clay lump to a perfect vase, the part of the process of his development was not merely to walk the earth with an a, a angelic tour guide looking around at suffering. It was essential that he actually partake in the pressing of the potter, in the spinning of the wheel, in the heating of the kiln. He actually had to partake in human suffering so that then he can be the high priest to make atonement for our sins. It was essential and necessary in the mind of the writer of the book of Hebrews that Jesus 
go through suffering. We're told here, this is the key verse for the whole book of the letter of Hebrews. In verse 17, we are told that he must be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. That is the job of the great high priest Jesus, to be merciful towards us and to be faithful in the commandments towards God. So we've seen that he was made perfect. That's touching his, his uh, faithfulness. He was made perfect in his uh, obedience to God, but he was also requiring to be merciful. That is that he had to represent us. Therefore, he had to go through life suffering like us. So can you imagine, for, if, we, if we just flipped it on its head for a moment and we re- remove this, this two-word ver- two uh, section of the passage, we just say he was made perfect without suffering, maybe you write in. He was so perfect. He was so sinless. He was such a great human. He lived sinless without suffering. And then you're told later on in the book of Hebrews, and you're told by Jesus himself, I am your savior. Come to me. I'm sympathetic. I know what it's like. Verse 18 says, I can, I can sympathize with you who suffer in life. And you, you just think, do you? Do you really? Kind of like when you're in, a, in the middle of a financial crisis created by the people you elected, right? And then the politician comes on, comes on screen, you know, Huge mansion, one of their mansions behind you, uh, huge camera screen. Uh, they, they got glass uh, uh, barriers between you and them lest you make them sicky. And uh, there they are on TV and we say, we all feel the pinch of this financial cost of living crisis. And they order their servant to go and turn the page for them as they read from their script. And you sort of hear that with your children sitting around a table eating wheat bix for the fifth meal of the day. You go, I don't think we do all feel the pinch of the cost of living crisis. Actually, thank you very much. So it would kind of feel in our sinless, the sinfulness rather, we would relate to Jesus in that way. Really? You know what it's like to, to go through the horrors of that. You're a real human, are you? Yet you never suffered. So in order to make us able to relate to our Savior, in order to make the Savior able in actual experience and living memory in his mind to relate to you and I in our suffering, God made him perfect through suffering. Verse 11 says, because he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, he makes us holy. And those who are sanctified, that's us, we're made holy by Jesus in his death for us. That's the act of a priest. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have something in common. The English comes out of the Greeks that we all have one source. Well, this is what it means. It means that we have something very important in common, and that's our humanity. We're human. Jesus is human. The sanctified ones are human. The one who sanctifies us is human. Therefore, it is fitting that we both go through the same kind of human life, which demands, which demands suffering be experienced by our Savior, by the founder of our salvation, by the pioneer of our rescue. It is necessary that he go through suffering. Not only from our point of view, but also maybe consider it from Satan's point of view. Not usually, he doesn't get a lot of airtime in church. Try and and spare a thought for Satan for a moment. But think of him as the scripture projects him as the great accuser of the brethren. And he takes no rests. And he would let no uh, opportunity slip to jump out and accuse God of injustice and his saints of unrighteousness. And so we we even see this in the Old Testament. When when Job is worshipping God and their God commends him. Satan, consider, consider Job, my faithful, righteous servant, blessed in all of his ways, worshiping me in uprightness. And Satan says, as Satan does, he says, of course he loves you, worships you, praises you. You have set a hedge around all his ways. His life is free from sin. Anybody can worship a God that keeps them out of suffering, but you raise out your hand. You let me strike Job and bringing him into the gutter of suffering, then he will curse you to your face. And so he's encouraged to do by his wife. Satan could say this very same thing about our Savior, and that is a problematic thing. As the great accuser of the brethren and our God, blasphemous as Satan is, he does that. He could point to Jesus and say, oh, perfect, sure, perfect, as long as he didn't step down 98% of the paths of temptations that humans face. I mean, it's pretty easy to not sin if you're perfect and you never suffer. But God put his own son, his own dear son, through the suffering of human life so that Satan's mouth might be shut and so his accusation stopped dead. Jesus suffered like we did so that he might, in beating temptation, be the perfect, proven savior. 
So also it is that God required him to live a life of suffering for that very same reason. God sending his son into the world to show forth his own proven perfection was to us, it was to Satan. It was ultimately, though, to God. The, 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 the sacrifice that was going to be taking away the sin of the world had to be assessed by God's divine eye and therefore undergo all of the harshest of temptations so that he might come out the most proven, sinless, perfect vessel that could be imagined. There's an old um, writer, of course, many of you will know him, St. Augustine. And he wrote, he sort of wrote in response to this question that I think is fairly natural. As we think about Jesus being tempted, we go, see, I've experienced something of sin. I think a fever pitch of sin. I've experienced a, a strength of sin that Jesus didn't experience because when I mean, the logic seems to show, he never gave into it. I frequently give into it. So I guess sin has enforced its grip, its, 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 its strength upon me to a degree it never did to Jesus. I get it. He had to be sinless, but we just need to be able to say, I've suffered more of sin's power than Jesus has. And Augustine against the heretics who were, who were trying to argue from that that Jesus was not truly human like us, he argued against them and said, Jesus himself, in fact, can be likened to an oak tree, and we are like little saplings. If you have, you have a little uh, beginner sprout of a tree and then a sapling and a few larger ones in their cycles of growth and then finally this huge, bold, uh, uh, strong, ancient oak and, and a storm comes through, uh, a light breeze just as the storm is starting is enough to maybe flatten out the little, uh, uh, the, the little uh, sprout. And then as the, the storms really gather and, and gain in their strength, the, the sapling might be ripped up from its roots. And then again, as the, the gale force winds start coming through and taking roofs off houses, then these, these smaller trees are breaking off their branches and maybe even snapping half in the trunk. It would be improper for any of those trees to say, of the tree still standing, I have felt the force of wind greater than you because it has broken me. It is actually the tree that stays standing under every lesser wind and remain standing under the strongest wind that this earth can rally up, it is that tree and that tree alone that can actually claim to have felt the fullest brunt of the force, even though it beat it. So we must think of Jesus, that he is not less affected by the grips and the powers of sin just because he didn't break. His unbrokenness means that he didn't just tap out like you and I do at the tiny ripples of the pond. You admit we drown in ripples of a pond. That the water is about three inches tall. We're lying face down. We could roll over. We lie face down on purpose and cry that no lifesaver came for us. Jesus is surfing tsunamis and stepping over waves that swallow continents. He looks at us. He is the one who is greater and who is uh, uh, fighting and who is defending up against much harder winds of temptation than us. Jesus has actually been tempted worse than you and I. He's actually suffered, though perfect, Worse than you and I could ever imagine. Jesus suffered just as you and I have. There's, there's actually some things we can just look at in Jesus' life uh, and, and really realize and lean into the fact that he didn't, he didn't get an IV line from his divine nature in order to be a kind of opiate to his human suffering. It wasn't as if he went through those sufferings and, and acted out a kind of uh, a sufferingness because he'd learned to do so from humanity. It wasn't as if he was just walking through a Sims simulator and, and clicking through the conversations and, and ticking, pressing A to click yes. That was not how Jesus worked through his... He actually embodied in his person the human nature. He had a human mind, emotional life, body, affections, fears. He had fatigue and tiredness and suffering was applied to him. Jesus in his life, since we don't ever hear about Joseph, after Jesus was 12 years old, there's, there's every reason to suppose, and many church historians have, that Joseph, his father, died at a young age. So Jesus went through fatherlessness. Jesus would have taken on the role of providing and defending for and looking after his widowed mother and his bustling household and the economy required for that. He would have gone through family dramas. There was a lot going on in the, in the Bar jo Joseph household. There was lots of rumors about his mum and how she got pregnant. There was other strange rumors about his cousin John, who eats a lot of bugs and uh, uh, was born to people old enough to be his grandparents. There was uh, strange persecution that he would have gone through in his family. We even see this in his adult life, his brothers saying he's going crazy. There was religious persecution 
from the higher ups. There was tyrants from his, the day of his birth that wanted him dead. There was poverty. Jesus' parents, when they dedicate him as a baby to the temple, uh, use a sacrifice that was only allowed to be made in lieu of an animal. They were allowed to give a small dove if you were very, very poor. That's what Mary and Joseph bring. He lived as a child in poverty, wearing rags. He suffered through loneliness as a single man. He suffered through the betrayal of deep friends that he had spent so long investing in, speaking to, praying with. He suffered through physical labor as a carpenter before electric drills. He suffered with waiting. He had to be patient. The creator and Lord of time had to wait for the sun to rise a few more times before things that God had promised him could come to pass. Jesus lived in obscurity and he also underwent the suffering of injury. Jesus suffered just like you and I, but without sin. Look at what he starts quoting from uh, the Old Testament. They seem a little bit cryptic at first. They don't seem to be good choices of quotations to prove that the Messiah suffered. I could think of better ones, I think. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Psalm 22 talks all about the Messiah, the Savior, the King, suffering horribly and calling on God. Oh, wait, he does quote from that psalm. I'm not claiming that I'm thinking online with the, with the writer. I'm just like, these ones don't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Until you start looking into the actual passages it's quoted from and you realize the, li- the, the, the direction that the writer of Hebrews is coming from. Here's what he says. In Psalm 22, after lots of suffering and dying and people taking his clothes and gambling for them and being surrounded by dogs and being mocked and being able to count all his bones because so much flesh is removed from him, the psalmist, who is really prophesying Jesus on the cross, says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And then he quotes Isaiah, who later on says, amidst the judgment coming upon Israel, he says, I will put my trust in him, in God. And then Isaiah says in chapter 8, verse 18, he says, behold, I and the children God promised me. God promised me that as a sign of his deliverance, he would give me children. And so he's saying, basically, Jesus is like this. Jesus is so much a brother of you and I. He is so much partaking in our nature and in suffering that he, like the suffering psalmist, looks at us and says, I am in the midst of these suffering people. I am one of them. I'm among them. They are my brothers. In the midst of this congregation of my brothers, I will praise God. He doesn't mind stepping into our pew and worshiping God alongside us suffering saints. Also, he says, I will put my trust in him. What a condescension of all grace that God the Son was so low in his weakness and in his frailty, he had to do something like wait and rely on God. He could have just clicked and made whatever he was waiting for appear. But no, like us, he had to suffer in the waiting. And so he looks at us and says, behold, I and the children God has given me. The signs that God will give me a future kingdom, the signs that God's deliverance is nigh are the people that he has given me. Think of this, verse 11 says. Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. It's a pretty rare thing with older brothers having had one myself. They are pretty ashamed to be called your brother when you come up to them and they're surrounded by their friends. Maybe they're surrounded by their, by their, 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 their older mates, the, the people they're trying to impress. They're, they're, they're around maybe their cool high school teachers and you're a snotty-nosed primary schooler and you run up with a bag that's too big for you and undone laces and you hi, I'm his brother. And he goes, I don't know this guy. Who, who is this? Let's beat him up quickly. So often our brothers will be rightly, I think, let's be merciful, rightly ashamed of younger brothers and their embarrassments. My friends, if anybody, if anybody had a right to be ashamed of his younger brothers, it is Jesus Christ, the sinless Lord. And I'm not talking about James and the other guys and Judas and those others who are his flesh half-brothers on on earth. I'm talking about you and me. Jesus is conquering the world. He looks to his right and here we are, face down in a puddle, complaining of a storm. We, we are, we've tied ourselves up with crepe paper and complain we can't do anything. We have just covered in our own sin and our own food and our own mess, unable, unwilling to clean ourselves up. And still Jesus looks at us and says, God, in their midst, I will praise you. I am one of them and I'm happy to be. 
I will trust in you just as they have to. These are the children that I am honored, that I'm glorified in you giving to me. Not because of our worthiness or merit that we bring to the table, but only because Jesus delights to save weak, younger siblings and sinners. What an amazing thought. He has no shame in calling us his family before his father. He does not shrink back. He does not wiggle away from our naming his. He says no one who names the name of the Lord will be put to shame. So Jesus suffered. Jesus was made perfect. We said that. Jesus suffered like we suffer. That is quite a consideration. But Jesus ultimately... And this is the biggest reason, verse 14 onwards tells us, this is the biggest reason Jesus had to be flesh and blood. Not just to be made perfect to make the sacrifice, not just so that he could suffer, that's all true. The ultimate and highest reason, if we could order them, is that he had to be made mortal. The Lord of life had to be crucifiable. The God of glory had to be able to expire on a Roman cross. So verse 14 says, So since the children share in flesh, the children he's not ashamed of, the children he's come to save, the children he's come to identify with, since we share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. So that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So it's not enough that Jesus came and lived a good life and was perfect and taught us very well. He's not just an ethical, perfect teacher. That is not a salvation for us. He had to die. The gospel is not just Christ. The gospel is that Christ died for sins. He died. His death was absolutely necessary. It had to happen. God could save us no other way than his son becoming incarnate and dying a human death. And he would defeat or destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It's not the angels that he helps. It's the sons of Abraham those subject to fear, those under death's grip, those who die. That's us, the Abrahamites, the human sinners. So he says here, Jesus had to be able to undergo the destruction of death, but he flips the script pretty quick, so that he might effect the destruction of death. He must be able to be destroyed by death so that he could destroy death. This is the language of verse 14 and 15. It really paints this multifaceted picture for us. It says we are, we are these captives and, and death is our destiny and it awaits us. And because that is the fact, that is the case, therefore the fear of death overshadows and depresses us in life. And the devil is he who rules over us and oppresses us. And in his hand is the whip or the sword of the power of death, which he uses and wields as he will. And so it's sort of this old, this, old, uh, this battle uh, uh, imagery, if we could use this. It's as, if, it's as if there's a great beast, a monster named death that is outside the city walls. And the walls have been erected to try and keep us safe from it. But inside the city is the devil with all of his mastery, tyranny and abuse and oppress over the top of us. We don't want to leave because death is out there, but we cannot really live because Satan is in here. And, and here, he whips the, 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 the whip upon our back and he cracks his rod and his sword against us and throws out as he wills by his power of death, throws souls to death's grip to be destroyed under God's wrath in his own will and by his own authority. So he thought never to be dethroned by his powerful, deathly reign. And then, one fateful, fateful day, somebody is born who, though able technically to die, is free from the fear of death and is clean from the destiny of death. He is somebody untouched by sin and unable to be tempted. And so this boy, he, 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 uh, he amasses, Satan does, he amasses all of the forces of the local police and armed guard against him to try and slaughter him and many thousands of baby boys die in the attempt. But Jesus, protected by his father in heaven, escapes death. And then, and then he comes back and there are other attacks against his life, but he is kept safe from the father. There is, there is a, a, a time when he is alone in a desert, completely forsaken it seems. And so there the devil amasses his sharpest, his three pointed temptations against Jesus and in his fasting, in his suffering, and yet he can't topple him. 
And then later, at an even more opportune time, he, he uses a, a dear friend to betray him, maybe, maybe just making him just that close to the edge to topple into frustration and angering sin. And then using that friend's betrayal, he then brings Jesus within, within inches of the wrath of God as the mighty vat of God's fury is about to be tipped upon his soul and the devil tempts him, say no to the wrath. I'll give you the kingdom. I will give to you what God has promised, but don't go to the cross. And even there, Jesus, wrestling with the temptation, says, God, take the cup from me if you can, but not my will. Your will be done. The final, the final attempt of the devil to throw his hooks into the soul of Jesus snaps. He's unable to bring him into sinfulness. And Jesus, therefore, goes to the cross and by his mighty resurrection three days later, blasts a spear through the head of Satan and waves a, a flag upon it that death is defeated. The one who held it is disarmed. You may live and live with freedom from the fear of death, verse 14 and 15 tell us. That's this, this sort of battle imagery that, put, that the writer of the Hebrews gives us about our salvation effected by Jesus, flesh and blood death, and then victory over death. There is one thing that is missing from at least my exposition of these verses, which could leave us just even a little bit of humanism, of liberalism, this idea that we're really not all bad, you and I. We're pretty good. I mean, if God died for us, we could have some value. I mean, look at all the good that we've done, and you're pretty sharp, and I'm pretty smart, pretty funny, and you're pretty laughable. You know, we're, we're, we're great, you and I. We're, the human race is not so distraught. We're not, we're not with the devil. We're under his effects. You see, sin is this great victim uh, uh, kidnapping that happened to you and me unwillingly. Sadly, we were taken from our righteous home in Eden. We were thrown under the devil's power and dominion, and, and he's a real tyrant and a bully. All the sins you've done, he made you do. And the death you were going to go to, oh, he was going to send you there. It's all the devil. It's all death. Sin is this thing outside of us, a cosmic karma affecting us, but not being done by us. And that would be an erroneous, heretical, anti-gospel, anti-Christ way of thinking. Because for all of the oppression of the devil and for all of the fear of death and, and death being the sword in the devil's hand, ultimately, the reason we are going to death is not ultimately because of the devil. It's because of God's wrath over us. The devil is just a little pre-death taste of hell, but he's the Lord's devil. He's not actually the one who, dis, who hands down condemnation for sin. It's God. It is his wrath and it is the breaking of his law. That's why verse 17 gives us the theological underpinnings for the destruction of the devil, the breaking of the wall, and the disarming of death. Look at what verse 17 says. Yes, the devil must be beaten. Yes, death must be defeated. But ultimately, it is so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Our great horror is not that we're in a situation. It's not that we're in a bind. It's not that we have an enemy. Ultimately, it's that we have a judge and we're guilty sinners and that judge has furious wrath. That is what propitiation means. It means to satisfy and to placate the wrath of God. Jesus came to destroy the devil by paying for your sins. Jesus came to blast open the walls around us in the fear of death by defeating death after paying for our sins. We no longer have to fear death because Jesus has absorbed the wrath of God, ushered it into complete payment. God now smiles on you and I as he does to Jesus if we are in him by faith. Jesus died in his flesh and blood for us so that death would lose its grip, the devil lose his power, and God displace his wrath. This is the gospel. But we have one last verse to consider before we close. That is verse 18. Jesus took on flesh and blood so that he might be made perfect to make the sacrifice. He was made perfect through his suffering and he made the sacrifice through his death. Here's one last application that the writer of the Hebrews makes. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now there's this sort of post-resurrection application to us. 
That since God has accepted his sacrifice and God has raised Jesus back to life and God has placed Jesus in heaven, you and I can now relate to Jesus vertically as this older brother that he's told us he is. We can relate to him as his people. We can relate to him as somebody who in every respect was like us and in every sin he gets us. He understands. This means that in every sin that you and I are struggling with, Jesus can say, I suffered in the temptation towards that sin. This, this is, we wouldn't be able to say it if the Bible didn't say it in black and white. There it is. You and I struggle with temptation, and by struggle we mean mostly give in, wish I didn't. Jesus actually struggled. He actually fought that temptation that we give in to and tap out in round one. He goes the full 15 rounds and puts it to death. Jesus suffered in temptation. You you might have lustful temptations. You may have money temptations, family temptations, possessions temptations, and covetousness. Whatever temptation you have, Jesus suffered under the weight of that temptation. You and I have temptations that come from within us. Jesus had only good motives within that were being twisted by people and the devil on the outside. Jesus never had the internal longing for sin, but let me submit to you, that means he suffered all the more in temptation. You and I I suffer in temptation, and we hate the sin that's coming up against us, and we really struggle against it. But it is a poisonous dish served up, coated in honey. Because for you and I, there's still enough sin in our nature that we we can never admit that we fully and entirely hate our sin. There's always just a little bit of it that is tasty to us because we're sinners until the resurrection. But Jesus was was struggling and was resisting all temptation with a perfect unfallen mind and a perfect unfallen hatred of iniquity. No one was repulsed by sin and the temptation to do it more than Jesus. He suffered under temptation For every temptation you and I have suffered and undergone and given into, Jesus has also, but he was without sin. Jesus was suffered under his temptation, but never gave in to that temptation. Therefore, he is able to suffer. Sorry, he is able to help you and I as we are tempted. The verse doesn't say he can excuse us. He says, it's okay, I did it for you. It doesn't matter that you sin. He says, I've made you sanctified in God's sight, now I am able to empower you in the life that you live to resist temptation. He's able to help those who are being tempted. There is not a single sin that you are struggling with now that he didn't overcome in his life, never having sinned it himself. There's not a single sin that you struggle with now that he didn't feel the weight of at Calvary and be made personally guilty for it, though he never committed it. He became responsible for sins he never committed. He had sins on his soul that he never had in his actual lived record. Jesus, for every sin that you struggle with, he paid for and propitiated the wrath of God for. And verse 18 says, he can now help you with it. Let us make no excuse for tolerating sin just because we have a perfect brother in heaven. He'll get us out of this bind. Let us rather look to him for help and trust him that he will empower us against every sin and against every temptation because he alone is able. If you have not, as we talk about all of this, if you've never actually taken in the salvation of Jesus, if you have not actually been converted, your life transformed, if you have never had the assurance of pardon that all of this which is true about Jesus is true for you, if you have never had faith in him, called on him, if you have never had the the confidence that God will forgive you and has forgiven you because Jesus did everything, then today is your day. Today is the day of salvation where forgiveness is held out to you in the palms of Jesus Christ and you are commanded, take it, receive it, trust in Jesus Christ and be forgiven today. Let's pray. God, it is impossible it is impossible to speak of these things and, 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 and complete its glory, having, having done and checked off all of that which could be said about it. We will spend an eternity worshiping you and how eternally insufficient one sermon feels on these verses. Father, would you please send your Holy Spirit now to take the truth which has been spoken. Get rid of any error that was said or any misunderstandings which were had. 
Would you apply the truths which are from Scripture into our souls so that we might be more motivated to leave behind our sin, so that we might be more fearless as we think of death, so that we might be more confident in the pioneer and the founder of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Please, Lord God, open our hearts to behold wondrous things out of your word, wondrous things that pertain to Jesus Christ and his salvation. We pray also, Lord God, that for those who are here in our midst who have not committed their life to Christ, who are still under your wrath, the fear of death, the power of the devil, and your condemnation, would you please, Lord God, give to them a heart of faith so that they, in trusting Jesus, can be swept into his kingdom and saved from the wrath to come. Father God, we pray all of this in your wonderful, your merciful, your gracious name, in Jesus' name, amen.